Five years ago, I'd been given specific directions to their sheltered abode. This says when it gets really steep, turn left down the dirt track. So hopefully, it comes to the right place. And I couldn't have been happier with the welcome I received. What a big dog. Hello. Hello. <laughs> well, I'm going to like it here. What a greeting. Good to see you. Nice oh, to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. We're all pleased to see you. Oh, we're all pleased. Who is this then? <laughs> this is Solomon. How old is Solly? He's two and a half. Sorry, not that I'm just focusing on the dog. I'm very <laughs> excited to see you both. Come on, Solly. 20 years ago, life was very different for Simon and Debbie Dawson. They lived in South East London and were thriving in their careers. Debbie as a conveyancer and Simon as an estate agent. With solid jobs, money and stability, the future should have looked cosy for the successful young couple. But for Debbie, life had become a little too predictable. Desperate to break away from the monotony of the city, she plucked up the courage to pitch a radical idea to Simon, to give up everything and start a new self-sufficient life in the countryside. To her surprise, he agreed, and so began their journey to a new, wilder life. With little experience of living self-sufficiently, they sold their flat in London and bought 20 acres of disused agricultural land on a steep-sided valley in Devon for £50,000. Ten years after first setting foot here, their home was an off-grid static caravan. Electricity came from a generator, heating came from a log burner, and rainwater was harvested off the roof. But the magic of this place was what surrounded their home. Simon and Debbie had transformed their land into a thriving small holding with a whole variety of animals. Pigs lived as free as it got and shared the land with horses, goats and poultry. Everyone, uh, everyone wants their dinner. Here, chickens! Food! Food, everyone! Come and get it! The Dawsons had seemingly created a rural paradise for themselves and their animals. I don't think it's for sheep, actually. It is slightly chaotic, but I like the whole feel and the vibe here. It has a very happy feel. It slightly reminds me of a feeding time in my house with dogs and children, but uh, it's just the eclectic mix of animals. It's brilliant. Bon appetit. Many of the animals here were rescues and rejects from all over Devon. We went to an auction to buy a ram and came back with a one-eyed, border, eight-week-old border collie that nobody wanted. And his role on the farm is he's the poultry guard and he's very good at it. Since he's been down here, we haven't lost anything to the fox. Simon and Debbie had built up a reputation for taking in waifs and strays. And these two recent additions had brought their livestock up to 138. Where have they come from? They've come from a lady that's died, so they need a new home. And is this quite common? You'll just get a call from a rescue centre saying we've got some ducks, chickens, geese... Pigs. Pigs. Anything and everything. If it needs a home, we'll try and... If we've got space, we'll, we'll try and put it up. I could sense the romanticism in this rural retreat. The animals that were rescued and permanently homed, as well as those that were bred as livestock, were living in a healthy and wholesome environment. One of the main ways the couple made money was through teaching organic courses. And on my last visit, Debbie was tutoring me on the intricacies of butchering. Now, this has been hanging for over a week, so it does lose some of the weight in the yeah. hanging process. But obviously, it makes for a better carcass. You can see how dry it is. Yeah, very nice. Debbie, how did you learn how to do all this? I became a butcher's boy for six months, part-time. Really? Yeah. And he wouldn't slow down. You had it, to keep up. I had to keep up with him, and I learned all the basic cuts. Wow. And then we started to do it between us. And, and I was going to say, just so you then taught Simon. Yes. It's like spouses teaching each other to drive. I can yeah. do it. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> now all they needed to do was teach me. First one is head off. 
but none of that's going to be wasted. No, nothing's wasted. The waste pile from the whole of this pig you can hold in the palm of one hand. Really? Yeah, we use everything. By doing the extra bits, you know, the faggots, the brawn, mm -hmm. all the rest of it, you can actually add in a farmer's market about £75 to the, Jenny, really? what, to the value would normally of a be pig. Wasted. Yeah. yeah. Next so, cut we want to do is separate the leg from yep. the body. Straight across like that? Straight down. <laughs> Lovely. Now, what we want to do now is separate... Can I say, this isn't your normal kind of kitchen instrument, is it? I was with you up until this. <laughs> <laughs> Simon and Debbie were certainly perfectionists, checking every carcass through for its quality. There we go. Lovely. A nice, deep, rich colour. That's all the blood that's been running through the, the muscles while they've been running up and down through the woods. Nice. Of course, I had to taste the outcome of all my hard work. Wow. Why have we got this rich flavour here? Well, part of it is the breed, Berkshire breed. Um, it's just about the porkiest pork you can get without mm -hmm. it being gamey. And it's had a, by pig terms, a long life. So the breed, the environment, its feed and its age. Perfect. That's all you need. That's it. Let's get these uh, chili so, sausages going. OK, so we want about two pounds of meat. Yep. So we're going to guesstimate two pounds of meat. So was it part of the, the plan when you moved here that you would start eating meat again, or did you just feel compelled? No, I think I stopped eating meat on ethical grounds because I didn't know how the animals had been treated in life and how they had been killed. And of course, once you start rearing your own, you know. There is something, for me anyway, almost primeval by eating it. It's very odd. You can almost feel your teeth grow. You know, you've gone back to caveman times that all of a sudden you are eating actual proper meat, not something that materialised in a packet. It's safe to say my career as a butcher wasn't really taking off. So you need to guide your skin with one hand yeah. and push with the other. Whoa! Look at that! Oh, I see what you mean, you're guiding it. Oh, no. <laughs> well... There we go. There you go. We, got, we definitely got some sausage there, look. Here we go. How's that? Lovely. <laughs> Avoid that, it does look slightly dog turdy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Gloss over that bit. Gloss over that bit, don't worry about that. So now, just twist it, presumably. Well, you don't actually need to twist them. You make a sausage, let it drop. Make your just, next oh, yes. sausage. Hold them together like this. Twist, oh, make that. your next sausage. Pop it through, and then it's neighbour. Look at that. I'm so impressed. They're all made here out in yep. the middle of Exmoor. In the middle of Exmoor, under a tree with our own pork, watching the pigs in the woods just on the other <laughs> side of that, that hedge. That is a, a, a tiny bit disconcerting. I didn't want to point that out to you. <laughs>